good to have you with us today. I just want to welcome everybody online as well, and uh, just welcome wherever you're watching us from, um, wherever in the world. It's so good to have you with us. And um, if you're in America where it's cold right now, it's so hot here in Melbourne, you need to come visit us. Uh, or wherever you are. Yeah, God. If you are visiting uh, today, g'day, my name's Arthur, and I'm on the team here at Wine Press, and it's wonderful to have you uh, with us today. And we're just, we're just believing God wants to speak to your heart today. You know, when, when, God, when God's people gather, God shows up, you know, and God always responds to faith, always responds to faith. So have a heart posture of God, what do you want to say to me today? That's what I do. Whenever I'm sitting in a, in a meeting, God, what do you want to say to me today? It might just be one sentence, might be one word, or might be a whole paragraph, whatever it is. But God, I want to hear it today. So if you say a prayer like that, God will actually speak to you. I just want to wish happy birthday to all the people that have had birthdays. Dear lady down the back had her 90th birthday. And I think, I think it's Julie's birthday today as well, Julie Burgess. And anybody else having a birthday? Oh, your birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, I, I have a birthday once every 10 years. So, I, you know, once you get past a certain age, it's about once every 10 years I have a birthday. Amen? Amen. Last week, uh, we started talking about our underlying theme for the year, which is the kingdom. How does the kingdom of God flesh out? How, does the, how, do, how do we as Christians, as people of faith, how do we actually live in, with kingdom principles uh, in a world that seems to be going crazy. Anybody think the world going crazy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad I'm not alone. We came up with a simple definition of the kingdom last week, and that is the kingdom is where the king rules, and it's then seen by his ways being followed. And um, so, so obviously, to function in the kingdom of God, we need to understand who the king is. Um, what's he like? What, what are, what are his, his ways? After all, that's one of the key things that Jesus came to reveal. Jesus came to reveal the king. He came to reveal God, what he was like and what uh, his ways were. And it's so important for us to understand this, friends. This is really, really important for every human being to understand this. Because as A.W. Tozer said, who's a, a scholar and an author, he said this. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's an amazing claim, that, isn't it? You know, I mean, more important than our gender or our sexuality, more important than our ethnicity or our family of origin or our tax bracket or which, which football team you barrack for or what your political persuasion is or what your education level was. Is it more important than that? Absolutely. Absolutely, because here's the truth that cuts across the whole universe. We become like what we worship. We become like what we worship. Tozer went on to write this. He said, we tend by the, a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes to mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. In other words, what you think, what you think about God will shape your destiny in your life. What you think about God will shape your destiny in your life. For us all. For instance, if you don't think God exists, then you'll live in such a way that, um, that this is all there is. This is all there is. It's crazy to me that people actually think that. But anyway... If you, live, if you think that way, if, you, if that's your opinion about God, then there's no boundaries, there's no consequences, no accountability. And what tends to happen with peop, these sort of people is to go around just leaving time bombs and bodies all over the place. If you think of God as homophobic, racist, and mad at the world, then this version of reality will shape you into a person who is, wait for it, homophobic, racist, and mad at the world. If you think of God as a left-leaning, inner-city-living, LGBTQ, WXYZ-affirming progressive, then this vision will shape you into the stereotype of the wealthy greenie with the we will not tolerate intolerance bumper sticker on the back of your hybrid. 
You see, your view of God, friends, shapes you. It shapes you and it shapes your behaviors. The ISIS terrorists beheading the infidel. The Hindus sacrificing a goat to Shiva. The African witch doctor sacrificing a little boy. The suicide bomber blowing himself up, crying. uh, um, Well, you know what they cry. Yeah, that one. The gay singer who stands up at the Grammy and says, thank you to God for his song about a one night stand. The Catholic nun giving up a normal life to live in poverty and work for social change. All these men and women do what they do because of what they believe about God. So clearly, what we think about God matters. Who God, the king is, has profound implications for who we are. For who you as a person are, for who you are in your marriage, as a parent, as a single person. What you think about God, who you think God is, has profound implications for who you are. But here's the problem, friends. We usually end up with a God who looks an awful lot like us. As the saying goes, God created man in his own image, and man being a gentleman returned the favor. There's a human bent in all of us to make God in our own image, friends. I was reading about a New Testament um, lecturer who taught a class on Jesus. And every year, he would start off the year by giving his new students two surveys. The first was a set of questions about the student. What they liked, what they disliked, what they believed, and so on. The second survey, given the next day, was exactly the same set of questions, but this time about Jesus. He reported that 90% of the time, the answers were exactly the same. The answers were exactly the same. That's telling, isn't it? It's telling. And here's how you know, friends, if you've created God in your own image, He agrees with you about everything. He agrees with you on everything. You know, He hates all the people you hate. He votes for the same party you vote for. If you're passionate about blank, then God is passionate about blank. If you're open and elastic about sexuality, then so is he. And above all, he's tame. You never get mad at him or blown out away by him or scared of him because he's controllable. And of course, he's a figment of your imagination. This is why theology is so incredibly important, friends. Theology is so incredibly important. The word theology comes from two Greek words. Theo meaning God and logos meaning word. So simply put, theology is a word about God. So if you have a thought about God, that's theology. If you have a thought about God, that's theology. And it's not like some of us are into theology and us not And others aren't. We all have a theology. We all have thoughts and opinions and convictions about God. Good, bad, right, wrong, brilliant, dangerous. We all theologize. But the problem is that much of what our society thinks about God is simply wrong. Much of what we read in the news or see on TV or hear on social media about God and the way he works is wrong. Is wrong. This is why one of the key things Jesus came to do was to reveal the truth about his father, about God. Who he is, what he's like. It's why Jesus was such a revolutionary character because he displayed God and it freaked everybody out. Why? Because they had preconceived, much like us, we have preconceived ideas about God and Jesus came along and blew them all up. It must have been incredibly challenging and and, and amazing to physically walk with Jesus. Not to just hear about him, but to actually walk with him, to hear his words firsthand, to hear him heal or see him healing the sick, to hear him teaching and see him delivering people. It must have been amazing. I think that's one of the reasons why that show, The Chosen, is, is so popular because it's like people can enter into that moment. And what made Jesus even more remarkable wasn't just 
what he said. It was also what he did that impacted people. Everything about this guy, Jesus, screamed, he is different. The apostle John tried, tried to tell us this way. He, he said in, in John chapter one, that this Jesus is the, is the word of God. He's the word of God. He also tells us that he, Jesus, this Jesus is the, is the light of man. In other words, friends, he was revealing truth to us about who God is and how we are meant to live and how we are meant to be. And in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, The Word was made flesh and walked amongst us, and we beheld the wonder of His glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was more than just a sermon or an illustration of truth. He was the Word. The Word, the word is, a, is, a, is, a, is a thought made manifest. And the Word was made flesh. The invisible was made visible. The intangible was made tangible. The Spirit made into human form. The Word was made flesh. And He dwelt. He dwelt amongst us. Friends, it wasn't just what Jesus said that was his sermon. Remember this, friends. It was what he did was a sermon. It was who he was was a sermon. He was a sermon in the flesh. Everything about him was a sermon, and it was so powerful. So it's, it's no surprise that they, that they tried to capture this and rec- recorded it by saying that they beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus' teacher, teaching was so impactful, friends. Think about this, that people, thousands, thousands would leave the cities and come and follow this guy, Jesus. They'd walk for miles and miles and miles with all the discomfort, sometimes without food and stuff, and they'd come to hear about Jesus. They'd come to hear without a PA system or without a flyer advertising or without a radio or a TV ministry or, or without social media. They'd come out to listen to Jesus because he was such a man of authority. I mean, his word was so powerful. His word was so powerful that when he came into somebody's house, the house got so crowded that people who had a sick person, they made a hole in some guy's roof and the Lord, the sick person down to the feet of Jesus. And at Jesus's word, at Jesus's word, he was healed. And when he was going on a cruise across the lake, when a storm sprung up, he was so much at peace with who he was that they had to wake him up. And when he stood up and, and spoke the word, the storm was stilled. If Jesus went to a city, he just turned, turned the city upside down. Such was the power and authority of this guy called Jesus Christ. Imagine, friends, can you just imagine? Imagine being with him. Imagine walking with him. It's no wonder that Matthew just left everything and went to be with Jesus. You see, Jesus wasn't just quoting philosophies. He was a living example of God. He was a living example of ultimate reality, of how life should be lived, of how you were created to live life, of who God is. Folks, Jesus came to reveal God and what he's like. Glory to God. We should, when we come to worship, it shouldn't just be always seeing a few songs that you hear some guy talks. No, you come to worship God as an overflow of what's been happening in your life all through the week. It shouldn't just be this, otherwise it's religion. It needs to be a living relationship. The difference between religion and, and Christianity is religion is working your way to God. Christianity is God has come to you in relationship. And we respond to him. He is ultimate re- uh, reality. That, he, that, that God undergirds everything. Everything. And if you weren't here last week, I really encourage you to watch the YouTube and catch up. I tried to say as simply as I could last week. Just, just listen to it a few times. Get it into your soul. You know, we're going to be talking about this probably all through the year, knowing me. But anyway, we'll give it a crack. But listen up. But last week we talked about just a few of the characteristics of, of, of who God is and what He's like. And we discovered that God is one, God is forgiven, God is generous, God is truth, and God is love. And then we also saw that how they were reflected in Jesus. So I thought today we might just go on a bit of a journey and talk about um, how this fleshes out in his followers, how kingdom living starts to work its way through our lives. 
It's an inside out kingdom. So many people will look at the, the Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes and stuff and they think they've got to do all this stuff. It's the Spirit of God living in you. It flows through you. Kingdom living flows through you. Otherwise, you just become a bunch of people that just follows a bunch of set of rules and then you screw up and then you just give it all away. That's not God's plan. So the first thing we talked about last week is that God is one. And if God is one, then he wants us to be one. Firstly, one with him and then one with ourselves. So he makes a way. He comes and he gives his life for us. And because of the price that he paid for our sin through his death on the cross and then rose from the dead to prove what he'd done on the Friday was enough, we can align ourselves with God. We can come back into oneness with God by repenting of our sin and laying our lives down and saying, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Come into my life and be Lord of my life. And when we do, God comes. He comes by his Holy Spirit who lives inside you. And you, it's not a feeling. It's a truth. It's a reality. It's not whether I get warm fuzzies. It's, it's, it's a truth. If you've submitted your life to God, then God says, I will come unto you. And then you live in faith and you train yourself in faith and you discipline yourself in faith because you've got to work at your faith because the devil wants to steal it away from you, friend. And if you think faith is just a feeling, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time. But we can align ourselves with God. And as a result, when the Holy Spirit comes, what happens? We get born again. The Holy Spirit joins with our spirit and our spirit comes alive. Suddenly we start to see life in color instead of black and white. Suddenly we start to get an insight into the spirit world, not just the physical world. And he then empowers you to live kingdom life. He then empowers you to become one. To become one with the Father and then to experience life as it, as it was meant to be. So we are now empowered, friends, to take our inner journey toward oneness. What does that mean in our language? That means toward wholeness. You are now empowered by God, ultimate reality, to move toward wholeness. That means you can deal with your inner stuff. You can deal with your junk. You can deal with the baggage that you pick up in life. That your baggage doesn't have to define who you are. No, God defines who you are. So you don't, you don't have to live fragmented anymore. You don't have to live fragmented anymore. For me, this primarily starts out with our understanding our identity. As humans, we get our identity from a host of different places, don't we? Meaningful adults. In our lives, achievement, possessions, even nowadays social media, I guess. But this is why we can end up being different people with different groups. That's why people call us hypocrites. I need to catch up with last week. Why do we do that? Because we're looking for affirmation. We're looking for our identity. And we're trying to find it in the wrong places. But our true, because our true identity can only come from God. Not because of what we do, but because of who say, he says we are. Why? Because he's the creator. He's the inventor. He's the one who designed us and put us together. And he says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it is good. That's who God says you are. You see, identity is given. It's not earned. Our world tells you, you need to earn your identity. You need to be top of the tree. You need to be the best at whatever. You need to have the best friends. You need to be the best looking, the most trendy, whatever it is. And you try and earn it, friends. You will always be broken if you do that. You will always be broken. You'll be broken in your marriage. You'll be broken in your relationships. You'll be broken in your singleness. You'll be broken as a parent. You'll be broken as a child. You need to understand your identity is given to us. By God, and then when we, when, we, when we understand that, we can start to unload all the baggage, all the rubbish from within us so that we can be one as he is one. Our darkness, our sins, our woundedness, our agendas, we can bring them all out and we can let the light shine. We can let the light shine on. And that's why regen is such a wonderful thing. We're doing another regen course at the end of March. I encourage you, get on that and stay the course. 
Don't just get, do four weeks and then bail or six months and then bail. Stay the course. Why? Because it's worth it. It's your wholeness. Stop living broken thinking that it's okay. God calls you to oneness as he is one. To run the race, friends. You know, and you'll know when you get it, friends, that you can be one before God and before one another. I mean, I'm sure we've all had times where you've been with a group of people where you've had such a sense of oneness of purpose, oneness of a commitment, and you'll sacrifice for it. Well, you're willing to do, to do whatever. And that resonates within you. When you're within it, you know, like I, I was in the, the sporting arenas and stuff, and, and all our coach was trying to get this, this oneness as a team, that we'd, be, we'd die for each other. We'd go to war for each other. We'd be into and, and when you got it, it resonated with you. Non-Christians, most of them non-Christians. And they you know, and then you, you, you get this, and it resonates. Why? Why do even non-Christians get it? People of faith get it. Because that's how you're made. You're designed for this. You're designed for this. This oneness. You've been created for this. We've been created in his image. And God is one. God is one. The next one is forgiveness. God is forgiving. Friends, if you've had somebody who's wronged you, who's hurt you, who's abused you, who's run you down, welcome to the human race. <laughs> we all have, haven't we? Everybody on the planet has this. But here's the thing. If you haven't forgiven that person, then, friend, you're out of sync with God, and you'll be in pain. You'll be in pain, and you'll try and kill that pain off through a whole bunch of comfort behaviors, ranging from trying to deaden it through alcohol or drugs, ranging from trying to have all these other comfort behaviors like pornography, masturbation, illicit affairs, eating too much chocolate. That's my one. I had to say that because you might think all the other stuff was. <laughs> Used to be. If you don't learn to forgive... You're out of sync with God, and you'll live in pain. You'll just live in pain. You know, the word forgive in Greek is two words. It means to send away. To, so to forgive is to take that scorecard. It's not saying that what somebody did it was okay. Please don't hear me say that. But it's about taking the scorecard of what, what they owe you. And it's to send it away. You transfer the debt to God. You transfer the debt to God. So if person X does X, Y, Z to me, then I take the debt that they owe to me and I transfer it to God. And then I become free to love. And I become free to live. Forgiveness is different from trust. Forgiveness is different from trust. Please understand that. But if we hold on to unforgiveness, then we're not separating ourselves from the hurt. And as a result, friends, as a result, we separate ourselves from God and attach ourselves to the hurt. That's what unforgiveness does. You separate yourself from God and you attach yourself to the hurt. And it will dictate your life. But once you forgive, you detach yourself from the hurt and you attach yourself to God. See how that works? And that's how we get back in sync with God. So when we forgive, we're imitating God because God is forgiving. And we're lining ourselves up with the deepest core part of our being. We're now coming into harmony with God. We're starting to sing in the same key uh, as God because the deepest point of reality is to live in a forgiven state. So if you're here today, friend. And I know in a room this size and people watching online, if you're here today and you're carrying around that, this woundedness, then you're out of sync with God. And that's why it hurts so much. That's why it hurts so much. To get free, you've got to send that hurt away and you've got to transfer the debt owed to you to God so that you can be free. Next verse is generous. Our God is a generous God. I heard a fellow pastor describe the single mom in his church who had four kids, and the husband just got, got up and just left her one day. 
And she was just struggling trying to meet ends meet, trying to figure out how she was going to pay the mortgage. And she used to go walking. And she'd walk down in this particular street and saw a particular house and thought, that's a beautiful house. I'd love to live in a house like that. But because she was a single mom, she felt she could never be able to do that. And then a few weeks later, the bank um, came to her, and they were going to foreclose on her mortgage because she just couldn't make ends meet. So she was in a bit of a state. At that point, a couple from uh, her church knocked on her door and introduced themselves and said, Look, we don't know you that well, but we've heard what's happening. And then they asked her if she'd like to come for a drive with them for 15, 20 minutes. So she said she would, and she got in the car with them. And they took her in the car and drove up um, the street and drove into the driveway of this particular house that she really liked. And they turned to her and said, we'd just like you to see your new house. We just bought you this house. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's beautiful. Doesn't that just stir you? Doesn't that just do something inside you? And even if you're here today and you're not even a person of faith and not wanting to have anything to do, that that story stirs you. Why? Because it's lining us up with ultimate reality, with who God is and how we are meant to be. And friends, I want to tell you, it's not just the big things. It's the everyday little things of generosity, those acts of generosity. That makes you feel good. That's why psychiatrists say to you, if you want to feel good about yourself, do some good for, for other people. Do a generous act. Why does that work? Because it's lining yourself up with the ground of your being. The next one is God is light. As I said last week, light represents truth. That's what truth does. Truth brings light. So we can say God is truth. And he speaks into the darkness, saying and revealing things, so we can live in truth the way things really are. Have you ever been in a situation with a group of people and there's an, it's just uncomfortable? You know there's an elephant in the room, but nobody wants to say anything. You know, have you ever been in that kind of situation and you're kind of all walking around on eggshells? And then finally somebody says it. And it's like this, everybody's relieved because finally it's been brought into the light. The truth has been brought into the light. And don't we appreciate people who speak the whole truth, not just part of it, but the whole truth. You love people who speak the whole truth. You don't like people who give you part of the truth, do you? Just tell me the whole truth. Give me the, all the news, don't, not just part of it. But our, our humanness wants to just give the best part. Our humanness wants to just shield or just give a little bit of the, the whole truth. Then he says this to me all the time. Just tell me the truth. <laughs> so I'm getting better. I'm trying to. Why does this resonate with you? Why does it resonate with you when, when somebody is walking in the truth? Have you ever thought about this? Why, why do you hate politicians who say one thing and do another thing? Why do you hate that? Just give us the freaking truth. Seriously. Why do we need it? Because God is truth. God is light. And we need to have be walking in the light. It resonates with us when people are lining up with God and speaking truth. Now, the last one is God is love. John 13, love one another as I have loved you. How do you love one another? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, you've been, all been to weddings, you've heard the definition, how it works out. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. In that definition there, you'll notice that nowhere does it say love is a feeling. It's because love is a choice. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling. That's why Jesus can say, love your enemies, because you, you choose to love your enemies. You don't feel like it. You choose to love them. Friends, can I just say this to you? You don't fall in and out of love. You fall in and out of like. Like is emotion-based. So if somebody's doing all the things that you like, you, you love them. 
But no, you just really like them. You fall in and out of like, not in and out of love. Why? Because true love is choice. You choose to love. You choose to love. Danny chooses that with me all the time. And I'm a blessed man because of it. So God invites us to live grounded in him. But to illustrate this, he's inviting you into his story. He's inviting you into his song. So can I have uh, the band up, um, please? I want to I show you an example that hopefully you'll get hold of. I wanted to leave you with something that would hopefully just, yeah, I remember that. Every time you, every time you hear a song or whatever, I remember that. And um, I want to talk to you about how God's continually playing this song. It's like this groove. Um, that w- and, and this is what we're inviting people into when we're doing evangelism. We're not trying to say, you know, my religion's going to beat up your religion. My religion's better than your religion. Come join my religion. We're actually inviting people to encounter ultimate reality. We're inviting them into God's song. So when we start um, talking about this, I want you to picture this or have this sense of you're in this in this place where God's playing this continual song. So just whenever you're ready, Ben, can you just start something for me? So we have this kind of groove that's kind of happening continually and underscoring all reality. And I want you to think, just quietly, Ben. I want you to think, because I can't think myself. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to think. I want you, see, I told him the whole truth. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to realize this, that there's, there's no other song happening. And the whole of the universe, there's, there's no other song. Just this eternal groove that's happening, uh, this eternal song. It's why Isaiah says, I am the Lord and there is no other. In Hebrew, that's the word olam. It means goes forever. That's why the Bible says in Revelation that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He goes forever. Olam. He goes forever. He always was, always will be. And then he says to the Israelites, I am the I am. In other words, what he's saying is, I am it. I'm the thing that underscores everything in creation. And you hear this, this, this groove that's coming a bit louder, Ben. <laughs> it's pulsating. This song is pulsating. That's why scientists can look through microscopes and go down past the molecules and stuff, and they can still see movement. They don't know what the movement is. They don't know what's causing the movement. It's the Spirit of God. It's holding everything together. Ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. And the beautiful thing is that God's inviting us to join in the song, in the melody. Thanks, Zach. Suddenly the song starts to build this throbbing of creation. The throbbing of reality starts to build. And it underscores everything in creation. And God is saying, I'm it. I am the I am. I'm it. I'm the one that holds it all together. And as people start to come to church, and then they start to hear through, maybe through the spoken word, or through people saying worship, or through the fellowship over a cup of tea, or they start to see stuff, and they start to, to hear in their spirit the song. And it becomes attractive to them. And Jesus comes along and says to us, you have a part to play. Thanks, Kelly. And we start to join in the song. We start to join in the groove of God. We align ourselves. We align ourselves. We're not playing a different song. We're playing God's song now. And as we align ourselves, it expands all the more. And when you hang around God enough, that song just gets in you. And you just can't get enough of it. 
things happen, you might want to walk away, but you can't because that song, that groove, that rhythm's in you. It just draws you continually, and you might go away for a little while, and then you come back. Why are you back? Why are you back? Because the song. God is drawing you back. You can run, but you can't hide. It's why David said, where can I go that you, you aren't God? I go to the highest mountain. I go to the deepest ocean. I go for, from the east to the west. You are there. Because the reality of God is there. And God invites us. And he says, keep on pressing on. And he invites you into the song. So I want to invite you into this, this groove right now. So we have some instruments at the front here on the step, and we have a bit of a bongo gun and stuff. Who's brave enough to get out of your seat and come join the song? Come on, we have a whole bunch there. Come on, don't wait for anybody else. And maybe when you start playing, maybe you play a couple of dud notes or whatever, but it doesn't matter because if you stay long enough in the groove, you'll start to hear the key, and you'll start to hear the feel for it, and you'll just be in it. And you'll be in that place. There's a few more things here. Who's brave enough to come join the song? Come on. Who's brave enough? Come and join it. Come on. Do you want God? Man, I should be saying, where's all the instruments? Come on. Where's your heart for God? Or are you just an audience? Be a participator. Join in. And maybe we're running out of instruments, but maybe you can be percussion. And you can just put your hands together. Because you don't want to stand out from the crowd. I get that. Or maybe you can stand up on your feet. Why don't you stand up on your feet? And maybe you can maybe just start, tap your foot or something. And just start to move or sway your hips. Can I say that in church? And you start to feel part of the groove. And part of the song. So when we serve God. When we're, when we're doing anything around the place and we're serving God, it's just you're just being part of the song. Being part of the song. Just be part of God's song. And then as you go, as we go, as we join in further and further, as the music gets louder in us, we step across. We step across. We hear faintly right now. We see darkly right now. But at the moment of our chain transformation from this life to the next, the moment you go through the gateway of death, you embrace the whole song. You do not have to be afraid. You embrace the song, the groove of God. There is life eternal. There is, you're built into fullness in God. And that's why you never have to be afraid of death. Because the song is the song. And it goes and it goes and it keeps you going. And you might want to let your voice come. You might want to yell and say, thank you, Jesus. You might want to praise God. You might want to just get out of yourself and be His. Be His. And this is how you do kingdom living. It's not a series of rules. It's a relationship being fleshed out through you by the Holy Spirit as you obey Him and respond to Him. And you align yourself. Our God is one. Our God is forgiven. Our God is generous. Our God is truth. Our God is love. And He is so much more than I'm going to share with you this year. Is so much more. So you can stop being cliche Christians. Cliche people who only have this much understanding of God. So when the life goes to pop for you, suddenly God isn't. No, you're going to, by the end of this year, you're going to know the song. More than that, you're going to know the author of the song. Who he truly is. King of kings and Lord of lords. The creator, the maker of our being. In our world, praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thanks, guys.
Amen. So did you get that? <laughs> Amen. Hope you guys online got that too. I tried to explain to these guys during the week. I've got this idea. Actually, it came together quite well, didn't it? Yeah, God. Yeah, God. So when we come to communion, when you come to the communion table, and you take communion, if you haven't had communion with us, we just come and take a, a bit of a cracker and a, a cup and go back to your seat, and you can have communion whenever it suits you. But when you come to that place, when you come to take that communion, here's a wee prayer for you. God, let me hear your song more. Let me hear your song more. Because that'll be the thing that pulsates in you when you do life. And I encourage you with all my heart, align yourself with God as best you can. Because the Holy Spirit will come and empower you. And like I always say, I I don't know if you heard me before because it was kind of noisy up here. But right now we we hear faintly. We see darkly. It's like a mist. But when you step across the threshold into eternity, you're going to see clearly. You're going you're gonna to hear fully. You are going to be truly alive. Truly alive. Right now, most of us, you know, our bodies are, are, are failing as we get older, you know, once you get, once you get born, you start to get older. <laughs> Did you know that? And uh, oh God, we long for the glorious day. Whether you come, Jesus, before we pass, or whether we pass. This week, Julie passed. One of our folks, Jan, passed. Now they stepped into eternity. All the pain and suffering is gone. And they're in a far better place. And that's the hope that we have to share. So when we invite people, we're inviting people into the song. You're not inviting them into a better religion than their religion. You're inviting them into ultimate reality, how they were created to be. And the hope eternal is God himself. Amen. So we're going to do some worship. I invite you to come have some communion. Once you once you're taking it, bring the cup back, and then we'll finish in ten or fifteen minutes. Meet with God in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.